function. So last night we had a wonderful movie, The Golden Time, Golden Years, and I think we have another movie coming up pretty soon next week too. So, and before I say anything, I have to remind you that this time the Culture Festival uh, emphasized on Chinese stats. So tomorrow, Thursday, and we have two lectures and workshops on contemporary Chinese dance. So please look at our brochures and go attend it if you have time. But if you have, don't have time for the workshop, make sure you go to the performance uh, this Saturday evening at Mendelssohn at 7. This uh, very special dance, contemporary Chinese Armada dance, that you would not be able to see easily in America. Even in Beijing, you know, but if you have to go to Beijing, you have to find special theaters for these wonderful cutting-edge dancing. So I invite you all to go and see. This is what contemporary stimulating art in China is. So it's really a spectacular event. So please come. So let me quickly introduce our speaker today. He's a very distinguished uh, professor of Chinese history and uh, culture from the University of Pennsylvania, Professor Paul Gaudin. Uh, he is, uh, he got his PhD in, from Harvard in 96, and since then he has been so prolific. So many people ask, how can he do it? Yeah. So he has foremost under his name, and gazillions of papers. So what I like his books and papers, I can tell you, is that he's very uh, unique and creative. It's, if you look at the titles, there's always something very specific, something very broad to look at it. So I can read the title because it's very interesting. It's classical Chinese thoughts, eight perspectives on a rolling landscape. So the eight perspective, that's no big deal. But the rolling landscape of a philosophy of Confucianism, that makes pickles of mind. And then the other, uh, the book that he published in 1905 is After Confucianism. Studies in early Chinese philosophy is the after conclusion that kept in the minds. It's very ex exciting. And now, you know, just to show you the dynamics of his scholarship and how he approaches Chinese philosophy and culture from very more traditional and not so traditional art angles, then you, you can see that in 2002 he, would, he published a book, he says, The Culture of Sex in Asian China. That's not a topic a lot of Chinese philosophers <laughs> do, but then he does it in a you know, very fantastic way. And then, of course, the, another earlier book, 1999, Rituals of the Way, the philosophy of Sun Tzu, that is a little bit more traditional. So you can see we have a fantastic scholar with a very dynamic, creative and way of looking at uh, Chinese culture, especially ancient Chinese history and culture. So, I encourage you to Google his name and read all those fascinating titles of his papers and I'm sure some of the titles you will find quite shocking and entertaining. So with that further ado, Paul. Thank you very much. Sir. That was very kind. The last time I was at the University of Michigan was 20 years ago for a job talk that did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, 20 years later, um, I have an idea about what might have gone wrong. <laughs> and it's related to the talk that I'd love, like to give today. I have some prepared remarks which will not last the entire 50 minutes that have been uh, budgeted. So I hope we'll have time afterwards for Q&A. The strong interest in anecdotes as a genre of philosophical literature from the warring states, at least through the Six Dynasties, can be understood as a byproduct of the non-deductive nature of most classical Chinese philosophical reasoning. One long-standing criticism of Chinese thought is that it is not truly philosophical because it lacks viable protocols of argumentation. Thus, it qualifies at best as wisdom Confucius, for example, might provide valuable guidance or thoughtful epigrams to savor, but nothing in the way of formal reasoning that would permit his audiences to reconstruct and reconsider his arguments in any conceivable context. As Hu Xi put it, quote, China has greatly suffered for lack of an adequate logical method, unquote. Such hand-wringing bespeaks the prejudgment that satisfactory argumentation must be deductive. 
I have no special definition of deduction in mind. It suffices to use that of Aristotle, quote, a discourse in which certain things being stated, something other than what is stated follows of necessity from their being so. This is often called syllogism in older translations because Aristotle thought that all deductive inference must be syllogistic, a notion rejected by modern logicians. Aristotle went on to give some examples of syllogisms, which the medieval tradition organized into types according to their so-called mood, that is, the nature of their premises and conclusion. The mood AAA, sometimes called Barbara syllogism, for instance, holds that if all A are B and all B are C, then all A must be C. And all of this stuff is in the prior analytics. All elephants are mammals, my example, not Aristotle. All mammals are animals, therefore, all elephants are mammals. Oh, excuse me, all elephants are animals. Such reasoning allows inferences that must be valid for every conceivable elephant, regardless of how many discrete elephants one happens to have seen in one's lifetime. Aristotle seems to have believed that such powers of inference were unique to human beings. China took a different tack. Many of the most famous Chinese philosophical statements are patently non-syllogistic. For example, Ji Wenzi acted only after thinking three times. The master heard of it and said, twice would have been acceptable. This could be construed as useful practical advice. The dangers of acting too rashly and too slowly are the subjects of contradictory aphorisms. For example, in our culture, look before you leap, and he who hesitates is lost. Here, Confucius recommends a prudent middle course. Think twice before acting, not once, but not three times either. <laughs> Clearly, this is not a matter of deductive inference, nor is the statement applicable in every conceivable situation. One should not think twice about whether to avoid an oncoming car. It is left to us to explore the range of plausible applications. But presumably, Confucius is talking about weighty moral decisions. These deserve careful consideration and reconsideration but as soon as one has made up one's mind, further deliberation only leads to inaction. Another example from the Analects. The master said, only after the year has grown cold does one know that the pine and cypress are the last to wither. I've discussed this passage elsewhere, and the details need not be rehearsed here. But one observation is crucial. The statement begs to be taken metaphorically, because no one would have bothered to record and preserve this line if it were really just a remark about pines and cypresses. The Analex is not a manual of horticulture. And metaphors have no place in deductive reasoning. When we say that all elephants are mammals, we are not speaking metaphorically. We cannot be speaking metaphorically, or else the very inference would be called into question. Speakers of English sometimes refer to an obvious problem that no one wishes to address as the elephant in the room. But that kind of elephant is not a mammal. Thus, Confucius's utterance, however we choose to interpret it, usually it is understood as a comment on friendship, cannot be deductive. Three general types of non-deductive argumentation in classical Chinese philosophy merit extended discussion. Paradox, analogy, and appeal to example. And let's start with paradox. Many of the paradoxes of the so-called disputers, Genja, can be made to seem veridical, or at least veridical in spirit, if interpreted sympathetically. For example, among the ten paradoxes attributed to Hui Shi, one finds the South has no limit, but has a limit. We do not know how Hui Shi himself defended this paradox, but there are interpretations that would render it veridical. The quadrant called South contains an infinite number of points. But it does not include the entire world. It is distinct, naturally, from the quadrants called North, East, and West. Thus, it is both limitless and limited at the same time. Another possible example of veridical paradox is eggs have hair. If this is taken to mean inside an egg, there is hair. That is, the hair of the unborn chick inside. Of course, it's not hair, it's feathers, but it changes it's the same word. <laughs> then it is an unexpectedly true statement. One paradox that should have attracted more attention from modern linguists is dogs can be sheep. Oh, I didn't put that on there for you, sorry. 
dogs can be sheep, which is veridical if it means dogs may be called sheep. The word dog is arbitrary and has nothing to do with the nature of the dog itself. Many of the disputers' paradoxes rely on the technique of exploiting a vulnerable keyword, either by using it in a sense different from what the audience expects, or by using it in one sense in one part of the paradox, and in a different sense in another. This is similar to the fallacy of equivocation in Western philosophy. Thus, tortoises are longer than snakes if one takes long in the sense of long-lived. Unexpected, but not untrue. The most famous paradox of all, a white horse is not a horse, can be identified as another example of this technique if white horse and horse are taken to refer not to horses, but to sets of horses. The set of objects fulfilling the requirements white and horse and the set of objects fulfilling the requirement horse are not identical. Later Moist exercises in semiotics attest to an interest in analyzing how such paradoxes could be constructed. A typical example, the fruit of the peach is the peach, but the fruit of the ji tree is not the ji, which seems to be predicated on the oddity that the word tao, peach, refers to both the tree and the fruit that it bears, as in English, whereas the word ji refers only to the tree, because its fruit is called zao, to be or Chinese date in English. From here, it would not be far to a hypothetical paradox, paradox like peaches are not fruit because they're trees. Not everyone was convinced of the value of such adventures in language. Shrinza rejected them as useless for the enterprise of moral self-cultivation. But some of the most important statements in the Laozi relied on the same technique of using a keyword in two different senses and therefore probably stem from the same intellectual environment. The highest virtue is not virtuous, therefore it has virtue, Lao Tzu 38, is usually not treated as sophistry like tortoises are longer than snakes. But it relies on the same rhetorical device, for the highest virtue is not virtuous to have any intelligible meaning, the keyword the, virtue or inner power, must be taken in two different ways. The first the, called shang the, or highest virtue, refers to the the that is real and potent because it derives from the Tao itself. Whereas the second da, merely da, refers to the great sham that human society, in its self-induced ignorance, wrongly identifies as da. Thus, the highest virtue has real virtue precisely because it is not the false virtue that everyone has been trained to venerate. Usually, such paradoxes are explained as part of a sustained rhetoric in Lao Tzu, whose purpose is to shake complacent readers and make them question their unnatural assumptions about the Next is analogy. Reasoning by analogy was a crucial mode of deliberation in traditional China. It was one of the hallmarks of Chinese jurisprudence and also figures prominently in early Chinese poetics, where it was identified by the critical terms B, comparison or juxtaposition, depending on whether it's B third term or B fourth term, um, or Xing, arousal. The precise meanings of B and Xing are notoriously difficult to unravel and indeed vary from one authority to another. In philosophy, one of the best known examples appears in Mencius 6, 8, 10. Mencius said, I like fish, I also like bear's paw. If I cannot have both, I shall forego fish and choose bear's paw. I like life, I also like righteousness. If I cannot have both, I shall forego life and choose righteousness. Although I like life, there are things that I like more than life and thus I should not keep my life indecorously. Although I dislike death, there are things that I dislike more than death, and thus there are some perils that I should not avoid. As moral philosophy, this passage conveys a certain mindset rather than formulating a definite argument. And as an argument, it is obviously not deductive. Just as a gourmet is prepared to sacrifice fish for the sake of a delicacy like bear's paw, a moral connoisseur is prepared to sacrifice his or her life for the sake of righteousness. Naturally, this analogy does not prove that righteousness is worth dying for. It merely illustrates Mencius's zeal. Many such analogies refer to natural phenomena with the unstated supposition that patterns observable in nature cannot be wrong. This conviction underlies arguments that are not always well received today. For example, 
Early in the famed debate between Mencius and Galton, the latter presents the view that human nature, sin, lacks any inherent moral orientation. Like a torrent of water, it will rush in whichever direction is laid open for it. Mencius responds by assailing the analogy. Water does have an inherent orientation after all, because it always flows downwards. Thus, human nature is inherently good in the same way that water naturally flows downwards. This argument has been harshly criticized in modern times. Its power must have been greater in a culture like that of ancient China, where reasoning by analogy was deeply respected. It must also be acknowledged that appeals to natural phenomena were often used to keep women in their place. In the Oath at Mu, King Wu of Zhou justifies his decision to attack the King of Shang on the grounds that the latter listens to his wife. <coughs> the king said the ancients had a saying, the hen shall not announce the morning. When the hen announces the morning, it means that the family will wane. Now King Shou of Shang implements only the words of his wife. Hens should just keep quiet in the morning because they threaten the survival of the family when they try to do the rooster's job. Not infrequently, Chinese authors saw meaningful patterns in nature that we would not recognize today. For example, comprehensive discussions from the White Tiger Hall by Hu Tong explains that women should follow their husbands because Yang sings the lead and Yin harmonizes. This is the problem with analogizing from nature. All observation of the natural world necessarily passes through one's peculiar interpretive filter, and therefore different people do not always perceive the same pattern when they perceive the same set of objects. And the next one, appeal to example. Appeal to examples, appeals to example are nearly ubiquitous in ancient Chinese philosophy. The most prominent text not to resort to them is Laozi. And it seems fruitful to divide the, text, uh, the technique into a number of subtypes. Appeal to history has been regarded as so typical of Chinese philosophy that Jeremy Bentham derided it as the Chinese argument. Rarely did Chinese persuaders fail to refer to examples from the past that supposedly bolstered their case, nor did they always feel obliged to recount details accurately. A more specific category is appeal to the sages of yore and the canonical texts attributed to them. Though it is usually taken to be typical of Confucian argumentation, most pioneered the use of, use of this device because Appealing to the sages was the first of the three nomons, San Kao, or um, also called San Fa, the three standards, that they held to be indicative of um, valid propositions. And this is B on, your, uh, on the screen. Quote from Mozart. How does one judge propositions? Master Mozart said one must set up a gauge. Speaking without such a gauge would be like determining sunrise and sunset on the basis of a spinning potter's wheel. One could never come to know clearly the difference between right and wrong, benefit and harm. Thus, one must speak in accordance with the three nomons. What is meant by the three nomons? Master Moses said there is verifying the root, verifying the origin, and verifying the utility. How does one verify the root? One verifies the root in the affairs of the sage kings of old. How does one verify the origin? One verifies the origin by investigating the things that the hundred surnames here and see. How does one verify the utility? Observe the benefit that the proposition would bring to the state, its people, and the hundred surnames, the hundred surnames and the populace, if it were disseminated by being made into law. This is what is meant by speaking in accordance with the three nomons. For example, the Moists' argument against fatalism, Ming, which they attributed to Confucius and his followers, runs essentially like this. The sage kings did not believe that all things were foreordained, with chapter and verse references to relevant texts. <coughs> Ordinary people do not normally act on such a belief either. And fatalism is dangerous because it would lead to moral apathy if people were to put their faith in it. Thus, fatalism is false. Monza also dilates tirelessly on the sage kings Yao Shun, Yu Tang, and the kings Wen and Wu, whom heaven established as sons of heaven, in contrast to the deposed tyrants Jie Zhou, Yo, and Li, whose downfall heaven likewise superintended. 
The commonplace of appealing to the example of the sages prompted a backlash in texts such as Han Feidze, teaching people how to build nests in trees or drill flint in order to make fire were crucial advances in prehistoric times, but in later eras they would have been laughable. If there were someone who built nests or drilled flint in the Xia dynasty, he would surely be ridiculed by Gwen and Yu. If there were someone who cleared water channels in the age of the Yin and Zhou dynasties, he would surely be ridiculed by Tang and Wu. Yet today there are those who praise the ways of Yao Tang, Wu and Yu as though they were appropriate for today's age. Surely they are to be ridiculed by the new sages. What may have been laudable actions by sages of the past are not necessarily appropriate to the very different society of today. Another productive subtype is appeal to proverbs, such as the one about hens announcing the morning mentioned above. In a later example, Jiaim wrote, a rustic proverb says, those who do not forget affairs of the past are teachers of the future. This is both an appeal to a proverb and an appeal to history at the same time. Though Jiayi goes on to emphasize that methods of the past might have to be adjusted to suit present circumstances. He probably did not make up this proverb because it appears verbatim in an unrelated item in Stratagems of the Warring States, a text that has preserved many other maxims as well, such as three people make a tiger, Sanren and Chengu. Um, which, uh, excuse me, everyone will believe that there is a tiger if three people independently claim to have seen it. Modern readers are seldom impressed by these subtypes of appeal to example. Appeals to history are sometimes deemed persuasive, but not if the circumstances are incommensurate, and certainly not if the examples are distorted. While appeals to canonical texts and proverbs fare even worse, usually being dismissed as argumentum ad veracunia. But one subtype of appeal to example that is not necessarily fallacious is appeal to exemplary conduct, both good and bad. This discourse is characteristic of the Analects. The master said, when I am walking with others in a threesome, there must be a teacher to me among them. I select what is good in them and follow it. What is not good in them, I correct. Like Mencius's comment about fish and bear's paw, this is more of a declaration of a certain attitude than a formal argument. It merely asserts the principle that there is always something to learn, whether positive or negative, from the example of others. The idea that we can learn by emulating other people's strengths and reforming their weaknesses has been central to Chinese philosophy for centuries, and has fostered the associated conviction that we must judge people's actions fairly, including our own. Appeal to example finally brings us to anecdotes. The appeal to anecdote is a subtype of appeal to example because the argumentative mode and purpose are the same. The anecdote is intended to furnish an instructive example highlighting the particular philosophical issue under debate. The inferences gleaned from it are never deducted. Take the example in Van Fadze of a lucky farmer who caught a rabbit that happened to kill itself by careering into a stump. Among the men of Song, there was one who tilled the fields. In his fields, there was a stump. A rabbit ran by, crashed headfirst against the stump, broke its neck, and died. Thereupon, the man set aside his plow and kept watch by the stump, hoping to get another rabbit. But no other rabbit was to be gotten, and he became the laughingstock of Song. Now those who wish to use the governance of the former kings to bring order to the people of our time are all of the same type as the stump watcher. The argument is explicit. Using the governance of the former kings to bring order to the people of our time is as foolish as waiting for a second rabbit, because it is equally unlikely that virtuous individuals will present themselves in government pro bono. Such anecdotes are fungible in the sense that they can be adap adapted to serve different arguments, and thus their ability to convey a priori truths is limited, if not nil. The example of the stump watcher is effectively applied in Confeza to political philosophy, but it could also be used, say, to argue against wagering one's life savings at the roulette table after winning one spin. <laughs> Essentially, its purpose is to emphasize the folly of basing one's plans for the future on the hope that a welcome but extremely rare event might happen again. 
in the Chaim Feitzel. Anecdotes are so fungible that one can occasionally find the same one marshaled in support of diametrically opposed positions. In 10 Missteps, a chapter in Chaim Feitzel, Lord Juan of Chi is criticized for ignoring Guan Zhong's deathbed advice to purge three self-interested ministers, while in critiques, number one, Guan Zhong's deathbed advice is itself criticized because a lord needs to know how to extract service from self-interested ministers. For if Han Feiza teaches us anything, it is that ministers are self-interested, yet indispensable. Han Feiza does not worry about whether Guan Zhong really said what was attributed to him, what stenographer would have been present at the bedside after all. The point is that arguments about how to deal with self-interested ministers could be persuasively praised or criticized depending on one's perspective. This is why so many appeals to historical events, as noted above, contain unconcealed factual errors. Their veracity was less of a concern than their illustrative power. It would be unproductive, therefore, to distinguish rigidly between anecdotes like that of Guan Zhong's deathbed advice in Fan Feitzel and the unmistakably fictitious stories of Kronzen, which are more commonly characterized as parables. None of these English terms, it should be noted, can be mapped neatly onto Chinese vocabulary. Consider the famous parallel that draws the inner chapters of Kronzen to a close. The emperor of the southern sea was named Zig, the emperor of the northern sea was named Zag, and the emperor of the center was named Dumpling. <laughs> Zig and Zag often met each other in Dumpling's territory, and Dumpling received them very well. Zig and Zag plans to repay Dumpling for his kindness, saying, all men have seven holes for seeing, hearing, eating, and breathing. Dumpling is the only one who doesn't have them. Let us try drilling them for him. <laughs> Each day they drilled another hole, and on the seventh day, Dumpling <laughs> No rational reader would object to this anecdote slash parable on the grounds that Zig, Zag, and Dumpling are not real people. We are invited to ruminate on the story, knowing full well that it must be fictitious, for the philosophical insights that it obliquely conveys, an exercise that remains fruitful to this day with our urgent new concern for maintaining the integrity of the environment. Thus, appeals to history, anecdotes, and parallels lie on a continuum of historicity, ranging from the generally unexceptionable historical example offered by nearly every ancient persuader at court to more questionable historical examples, such as Guan Zhong's deathbed advice in Pan Feizu, to parables with no pretense of factuality, such as the tale of zigzag and dumpling in Guangzhou. But fundamentally, they are of the same species, devices that aim to clarify a philosophical problem by focusing on a cogent example. The foregoing should not be misunderstood as a denial that Chinese philosophers ever engaged in deductive reasoning. There are several important classical Chinese arguments that can be restated in terms of propositional logic. For instance, the most defense of impartial love. If one were to investigate where these uh, various harms come from, where arise from, where do these things arise from? Do these things arise from loving others and benefiting others? One would have to say that this is not the case. One would have to say that they arise from hating others and despoiling others. If one were to categorize things in the world by means of names, uh, most diction, very, very thick. Uh, if one were to categorize things in the world by means of names, would those who hate others and despoil others be considered impartial or partial? One would have to say partial. Thus, it is not the case that engaging others with partiality gives. Thus, is it not the case that engaging others with partiality gives rise to the great harms in the world? For this reason, partiality is wrong, and that's kind of hard to grasp, um, even in Chinese. But I take it as an early attempt at a deductive argument, essentially a composite barber syllogism. If P, then Q. If one is partial, one hates and despoils others. If Q, then R. If one hates and despoils others, one causes harm. If R, then S. If one causes harm, one is wrong. Therefore, if P, then S. If one is partial, one is wrong. More complex deductive arguments can be found in later texts. Xunzi's elaborate argument against abdication, which he tries to rule out as a method of transferring sovereignty in all possible situations, contains an example of disjunctive elimination. It is said when the king is dying, he should cede to someone else. This is also not so, 
It's a very long passage. If the sage kings have already fallen, there is no sage king in the world. Maybe we can skip to what I think you'll trust me to say is a fair restatement of Shunza's argument. Either there is no sage, or there is a sage among the king's descendants or the three chief ministers. So P or Q or R. No, so excuse me, tilde P or Q or R. Um, if tilde P, then tilde S. If there's no sage, there's no reason for abdication. If Q, then tilde S. If there's a sage among the king's descendants, there's no reason for abdication. And if R, then tilde S. If there's a sage among the three chief ministers, there's no reason for abdication. Therefore, tilde S. There's no reason for abdication. That type of inference is called disjunctive elimination. My observation is that the opening premise is questionable. Shunza does not seem to have envisioned a situation in which there is a sage in the world who is neither one of the king's descendants nor one of the chief, uh, three chief ministers, nor is it entirely clear why succession by one of the three chief ministers did not, in his mind, constitute the establishment of a new dynasty. Consider the example of Yu, the sage who succeeded Shun, thereby initiating the dynasty known as Xia. But otherwise, the reasoning is sound. Ancient Chinese audiences were so familiar with disjunctive elimination that even jokers could use it in texts intended more for entertainment than edification. Queen Dowager Shen of Qin loved uh, Wei Chou. When the Queen Dowager fell ill and was about to die, she issued an order saying, when I'm buried, Master Wei must accompany me in death. <laughs> Master Wei was horrified by this. Young Wei persuaded, persuaded the Queen Dowager in Master Wei's behalf, saying, do you consider the dead to have consciousness. The Queen Dowager said they have no consciousness. Young Ray said, if your majesty's godlike Newman is clearly aware that the dead have no consciousness, why would you vainly take the person you loved in life and bury him with the dead who lack consciousness? And if the dead do have consciousness, the former king has been accumulating his wrath for many days. <laughs> your majesty, you will scarcely have time, you scarcely have the means to make amends for your transgressions. How would you have leisure for assignations of restated in propositional form, this yields P or tilde P. Either the dead have consciousness or the dead do not have consciousness. If P then R. If the dead have consciousness, having your lover buried with you is a waste. And if tilde P then R. If the dead do not have consciousness, having your buried, lover buried with you is again a waste. Therefore R. Having your lover buried with you is a waste, whether the dead have consciousness or not. And that is a valid inference. These few but memorable examples leave no doubt that audiences were aware of principles of deduction and thus suggest that Chinese philosophers crafted non-deductive arguments as a deliberate choice. Arguments that rely wholly on deductive inference, like Shunzi's case against abdication, are not easy to find. One can only surmise that they were not preferred. One consequence is that Chinese philosophy tends to demand a high level of interpretive participation from its audience. Perhaps this is what Confucius meant when he said, I begin with one corner, and if a student cannot return with the other three corners, I do not repeat myself. If the strength of deductive argumentation is supposed to be that it yields correct inferences regardless of circumstance, modus tollens is as valid as doubt in Dallas as it is in Krasnoyarsk then it follows that deductive argumentation yields the same results regardless of the audience's mood, receptiveness, perspective, and so on. By contrast, an audience presented with a statement like, only after the year has grown cold does one know that the pine and cypress are the last to wither, must ponder it sympathetically or else derive little, if any, benefit from it. Nor is the meaning that one discovers necessarily identical at every juncture of one's life. In one's youth, the statement about the pine and cypress could mean one thing, as one matures, gains experience, and compares it to other opinions one has encountered, it could take on previously unimagined dimensions. Chinese philosophy, like literature, painting, or music, requires connoisseurship. If we lack the taste, even more so, if we exempt ourselves from the task of developing it, we will miss most of what Chinese philosophy has to offer. Thank you. Well, we need some connoisseur responses. Yes. Thank you for
pretty fascinating talk. Uh, in China today, uh, in the university or the academy, uh, <coughs> what type of philosophy departments do they have? Um, if, um, after listening to your lecture, do they discuss and uh, embrace, for example, uh, what you've been talking about and, and what China has historically, or do they embrace, let's say, the type of philosopher like Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates? It's a very interesting question. The first thing I would say is that this concern is our concern. It's not a Chinese concern. Whether Chinese philosophy qualifies as philosophy is something you might worry about in Michigan, at Penn, <laughs> Harvard, Princeton. Anywhere people are familiar with Aristotle, learn philosophy in the traditional mode, and has to decide whether this you know, newly discovered tradition called Chinese philosophy counts. In China, you don't need to have that debate. It's philosophy. So this kind of concern emerges out of Western discourse. You don't find it too much in, in, in Chinese scholarship. Chinese philosophy departments today are, are, are quite diverse in the sense that there are people who teach Plato and Aristotle. There are people who teach Chinese philosophy. There are people who teach Marxist philosophy. Um, and I don't honestly understand how they talk to one another. I get the feeling that they, that they more or less don't. Um, not only that, but this material is, is taught not only in philosophy departments, but also in history departments as intellectual history, and then even in departments of Chinese as Chinese literature or Chinese tradition and so on. So a text like Guangzhou would be taught in at least three different departments with at least three different disciplinary orientations. But that is, a, that is less um, it, you know, peculiar from a Western point of view, because we do the same thing. We would teach Guangzhou in at least three different departments, too. Um, so that's the fact that Chinese philosophy departments have people that don't talk to one another. That sounds a little bit like the United States. But this concern about whether it is philosophy, if so, what is philosophy, if not, what is philosophy, it's a very Western kind of um, um, preoccupation. And um, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, philosophy is not a Chinese term. Quick follow-up. Sure. Uh, in philosophy departments at a place like um, U of M or Berkeley or Harvard or some place like that in the elite academies, we go with a, as you know, we go with the supposition, and then we do the deductive reasoning and come to a conclusion. Um, do Chinese people in general have a, have a problem with uh, this type of philosophy based on the fact that they don't accept the supposition right off the bat? No, um, I, I don't think so. I, I think Chinese people, both today and in the past, recognize and accept the power of deductive reasoning. And, they, and, and understand the concept of a hypothetical argument. Setting aside the question of whether the supposition is true, does this follow from it? You find writing like that in the Chinese tradition. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. I was interested in your discussion of the conclusion with connoisseurship being required in the audience. Uh, we do that, uh, for example, in music and arts. If you have not played a violin, you cannot fully appreciate the difficulty and the skill when you listen to a person playing violin. And that's kind of true. So I think that we do that as much as the audience of the Chinese philosophers. For sure, but we're not supposed to have to do it in philosophy. So if you have a valid deductive inference, it should be true whether you're in Dallas or Siberia or whether you're smart or foolish or whether you have connoisseurship or don't. It should be true everywhere. And that, that's what led to my conclusion that the demands placed on the audience are different. A Chinese philosopher, ancient Chinese philosopher, demands more participation on the part of the audience. 
if you don't see the wisdom in what I'm saying, your problem. And um, that works better in this kind of a philosophical culture than it would here. A philosopher here can't quite say, if you don't see the wisdom in what I'm saying, it's your problem. The philosopher here is expected to show how the influences follow from. Sometimes the supposition, or in sciences, the hypothesis, can be so off base you're wasting your time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, generally, look, I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying. I will sort of, as devil's advocate, say that there's sometimes good value in uh, testing a supposition that you don't truly believe in to see where it goes, what follows from it, that sort of thing. something like fungible? What does that mean? It's an accounting term, actually. It refers to money that's not tied to a specific budget. <laughs> so donations can be fungible, like donations to a university. It can be fungible and non-fungible. Non-fungible would be if the donor said, you must use this money for that chair. Mm -hmm. You don't do it for that chair, sorry, you don't get the money. Fungible means you can use it anywhere. And what I mean is that anecdotes, as Han Feidze uses them, are fungible in the sense that he can use them in support of any particular argument. And the proof that he does is that he uses the same anecdote in support of diametrically opposed arguments. So that says a lot of interesting things about the text. Either more than one person wrote it, or he doesn't care that he's advancing arguments that can't both be true. I think it's the latter. I think it, it is one person who wrote it, and the purpose is not to write a coherent treatise of philosophy that makes a point. The purpose is to show that he can argue two diametrically opposed positions and do so skillfully using the same anecdote. It's a very unstated sort of you, you have to you have to imagine what he's trying to accomplish. He doesn't say explicitly what he's trying to accomplish. In fact, I think he's misread quite frequently uh, because people suppose, questionably in my view, that he's trying to write a you know, coherent tractate on political philosophy. I think he's trying to do something more interesting, which is undermine that whole project by showing how different perspectives will uh, lead people to espouse, uh, um, different perspectives will lead people to defend different, different arguments. By the way, you have every right to not respond to my question, but I'm just curious. Again, you mentioned about the interview 20 years ago. And today, you realize why uh, that interview was a success. <laughs> That's a fair question. So, this was a search in the philosophy department. Some of you know the history of that search, so I don't have to go into it. And um, I, the way I would summarize it in a nutshell. I hadn't really, I hadn't quite realized all of this yet. So I was presenting Chinese philosophy to a room full of philosophers without preparing them for the differences in culture, expectation, and so on. So it came off as very poor philosophy. And I dare say that's how Chinese philosophy has come off in philosophy departments many, many times in the 20th and even the 21st century. And in order to make it seem at least not poor philosophy, you do need to take this seriously. It's not trying to do the same thing. So judging it by protocols that it never accepted and is, you know, it, it, you know, is not fair. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, your talk reminds me of a story from Zhuangzi uh, talking about fish. Uh, you are not the fish, how do you know the fish is happy? And then the response is, you are not me, how do you know that I don't know the fish is happy? Isn't that not deductive reason? Yes, but then what's the final resolution? The re final resolution isn't deductive at all. The final resolution is you asked me, and then this Chinese word, an, how, I knew, and an can also mean where. 
And so Zhuang Zi says, I know it right here on the bridge. So the final line is a joke, and it's not deductive at all. If anything, it's using um, Hui Zi's style of, if not exactly deductive reasoning, then you know, deductive flavor. It's, it's trying to one-up him by showing that the clever use of language will always be able to defeat this kind of logic chopping. Uh, to me, the best example of that, again, completely non-deductive argument, but unforgettable, is when um, Hui Tzu, the same character, says that I was given seeds of a great gourd, and, I, and, and it produced an immense you know, pumpkin, but I couldn't do anything with it. You know, it seemed amazing, but I couldn't do anything useful with it. I tried to make a, a bowl out of it, it was too floppy. I tried to make a spoon out of it, it couldn't hold anything. So I got frustrated and I sh smashed it into pieces. And Zhuang Zi says that's because you have grass for brains. If you had tied them around your waist, you could have used these gourds as a great buoy and then you could swim all around the four uh, seas. Uh, but you never thought of that because you have grass for brains. So that's not, that's not a deductive <laughs> argument. But there's a lot going on there. So there's the critique of of usefulness as a criterion for determining the value of something. Wait, I can't see the use of these words except as something that provides, uh, you know, as something materialistic, a bowl, a spoon or something. He can't imagine the value of an experience like swimming around the four seas, which has no quantifiable value, but it has a certain existential value that isn't nil. It's reckoned as nil only when you have an extremely narrow materialistic Conception of value. So you can you can unpack that story and make a lot of interesting philosophical um, you know, observations about it, but it is not itself a, a, a deductive um, argument, and it's it's in the same spirit as the one that you mentioned of trying to show how Huizi's method is inadequate. Um, it's fun and, and and it achieves something, but there's a level of insight that it never. Has Western philosophy had any kind of, uh, of an impact on, on Chinese philosophy? Since the 19th century, absolutely. Um, so that's a long and sometimes painful story, and it comes in different stages. The first stage was to try to show that we have stuff like this, too. So there is an interesting book about this. Um, so there was the first stage when certain previously neglected Chinese texts suddenly became very popular because they might have something like logic. So that's when Mozi was being systematically reread. Don't Su Mozi, some of these other sheets of some of these other texts that previously most literati thought were basically garbage. Um, were now suddenly interesting again because maybe they have something like a nascent Chinese tradition of logic that didn't become dominant but was there pride that we have logic to. That was sort of a predictable reaction and it, it, it didn't go very far, although it did serve to, you know, to dust off certain very interesting texts that hadn't been, hadn't been read seriously in many centuries. Um, of course, in the domain of politics, Western philosophy has had a tremendous impact on Chinese culture. Just think of Karl Marx. Friedrich Engels, um, or even non-Marxists have um, been inspired by Max Weber, Georg Simmel, and so on. So um, if you expand philosophy beyond moral philosophy and look at things like political philosophy, social philosophy, then modern Chinese culture has been tremendously interested in 19th, I have to say more 19th than 20th century, Philosophy, but even today, there's interest in people like Donald Davidson. Um, so, so there's interest in there's interest in, in contemporary Western philosophy too. Uh, I think Rorty, Rorty's very interested. Rorty's popular. Uh, I had to hear uh, this gentleman's uh, statement. Could you just uh, say that, please? Uh, he gave a, 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 a statement of, of something. And I didn't, I didn't hear it, and you didn't say it. And, and so talk. there's an anecdote in Zhuangzi, where Zhuangzi and his friend Huizi, who's very good at thinking logically, but never managed, manages to test Zhuangzi in one of these debates. They're standing over a bridge looking at fish in the river beneath them. 
And Zhuangzi says, how happy are those fish? And Plato says, you're not a fish. How do you know how happy? Right? It's, 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 it, you know, it's, a, it's a legitimate question. You're not a fish. How do you know that they're happy? Right? Can you attribute emotional states such as happiness to a fish if you're not a fish? That, that, that's a real question. Zhuangzi says, you're not me. So how do you know that I don't know that they're happy? There's <laughs> already a little bit of a wise acre response. A little bit. Um, and Plato well, says, you're right. I'm not you, so I don't know whether you know that they're happy, but I do know that you're not a fish. And therefore, I ask you again, how do you know that the fish are happy? And this word in Chinese, an, in classical Chinese, can mean both how or where. So Zhuangzi's response is a little bit of a joke or a pun. Um, you ask me, an, I know it. I know it right here on the bridge, right? That's where I know it. So on the one hand, this does seem, right, at halftime, it looks as though the deductive one is doing it. But then at the end of the fourth quarter, it's clear that the productive one has not won. And the text is saying that the skillful use of language and you know, all this stuff, right, that that will beat out Quaid's mode of inquiry any day of the week. And that's why I brought up this thing about the guru, which to me is the archetype of that, um, of that agenda in the text. Always thinking about how to apply something usefully. Um, that's, a, that's a limited perspective. Uh, this might be too big of a question, but um, apart from pointing out differences between Western uh, philosophy and Chinese philosophy, there are also speculations about how come the Chinese um, wrote that differently. So some say, oh, they didn't have much fact value distinction, which had handsome goes in that direction. Um, and, and so if you think about Monzo 6, 8, 10, like it, it, it sounds like yes, there's not much fact value distinction. It, it's an aesthetic statement to say, I like Bayer's paw more than fish. It's not a fact, right? And some say oh, it's, it's because um, it's more like a practical philosophy. The, the goal was different. It was about uh, um, generating desired action. It was about whether these arguments have enough effective weight for us to act properly and I guess we can speculate about the role of language, the fact that skepticism about uh, language comes in really early in China compared to what we see in Greco-European tradition. And now I realize what is interesting is that asking how come, how come they start, start writing like that, that already assumes Western philosophy that is the norm. And now we are asking why, why are they writing like that, right? I agree with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and I, now, I, as I'm listening to your talk, I'm realizing we don't really ask why why Aristotle wrote like that, that barbarous syllogism. Why did he write like that? And um, and I was wondering, um, you know, how come Western philosophy started stopped being a way of life? You know, we don't we don't expect a Kant scholar to never lie, or because you study Kant, you must never lie. We separate the two and. How come it became like that? And earlier you mentioned over specialization. How come people in a philosophy department they don't talk to each other? And this is the big question. Do you think like that is one of the causes that we specialize too much or so th those are many questions and they're <laughs> all big. Um, I'm indifferent vis-a-vis -vis this question of whether there's a fact-value distinction in Chinese philosophy. Um, indifference, but in my heart, not sympathetic to that approach as the key to understanding what's different about Chinese philosophy. Uh, I don't want to get into it too much because it doesn't really bear on this. I'm using 6A10 as an example of a cherished passage in Chinese philosophy. That can't possibly be a deductive argument. It has, it has no force as a deductive argument. So if it has value, the value is somewhere else. And then basically we can either say, let's ignore it, because it's not an argument in any Aristotelian sense. Or we can say, if it does have some other kind of value that we're not recognizing at the moment, let's try to think about what that other value might be. 
and set aside for now the question of whether that qualifies as philosophy. Um, because I'm cer certainly sympathetic to what you said at the mi in the middle, which is that what we're taking as a baseline is, is, is parochial. Um, philosophy is not a Chinese term. Um, and if we're saying that you know, this is weird and different, we're saying weird and different from what? Only what we're more accustomed to. Uh, it's not weird or different to somebody who's, you know, whose philosophy education at school didn't include any Aristotle, any Kant, uh, and so on. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought you were hinting about some linguistic reasons for the differences, in, and I'm not too sympathetic uh, about that either. Because I don't believe that Chinese people can't think deductively. I, I, don't believe that, I don't believe that they ever couldn't. And I think there's pretty good evidence that the force of deductive arguments was understood, and I even showed in some cases where the, the, um, the engine of the persuasiveness is presumed to be the fact that one inference follows from a, from a previous one. So it's not a limitation on the part of Chinese people. It's a choice. I can make an argument like this one, but I prefer to make an argument like that one. So therefore, I don't think linguistic determinism is going to help us very much. That would help if we were talking about a species of animal that couldn't think deductively. Um, and that's not what we're talking about. said before, there's an old saying that says the questions you ask are more important than the answers you get. Yeah. And, it, and it seems to want to push people, you know, this way, that way, and you know, have everybody kind of thinking about what they think it means. So I don't know Confucius, but I have a feeling that he would agree with the questions yeah. that you ask are more to, important. To not be in a box, but to see things. Confucius almost, almost says that. Doesn't quite, doesn't quite get there. Um, it's not just asking the questions, though, for Confucius. It's asking the questions and then seriously thinking through what your answer would be. You can't just ask the question, well, should I be moral today? Um, it's asking the question and then doing your best to come up with an answer that has integrity. You're not, it's not self-delusional, it's not right, that kind of thing. Um, but in the Confucian tradition, there is a great deal of tolerance of different answers. When those start, answers are sincere, it's okay if different people have different answers. Because when you start down a path and you realize anybody wasn't asking the right question, I should have been asking a different question, being able to be on your mind. One more question? Well, maybe on that note, we can close it. But I'm sure. If you guys have more questions, if you have more questions, please go up and talk to Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.